folks, how are you all doing? I hope you're still keeping safe and keeping well. I'm going to read the next instalment of the Year 3 Class Reader. So Oliver and the Sea Wigs, Chapter 7. The sea beneath the dinghy was growing shallower. First the faces of the wading islands appeared above the waves and then their shoulders. Oliver looked down through the clear water and saw mermaid villages clustering on the silver sand of the sea floor. The islands set their huge stony feet down carefully, picking their way between huts and fish farms. Iris peered down too, trying to spot people she knew. Merfolk were darting in shoals between the island's feet, but Iris was too short-sighted to make out their faces. Ahead, some of the isles had stopped, a crowd of great stony heads rising from the water. Their voices boomed across the sea, exchanging greetings and stories of their travels. Look, said Oliver. In the midst of the waiting islands stood the Thirlstone. There was no mistaking that towering outline with the stolen submarine right on the top. The islands around it were all casting wary, envious looks at its fine wig. Iris flapped the dinghy closer. A fire was blazing among the trees on the Thirlstone's top. Now and then, a small cavorting figure was silhouetted against the flames. The sound of drumming echoed across the water. There was no sign of those dangling glass globes. Oliver felt awfully afraid. He remembered what Cliff had said about the Thirlstone's liking for blood. Was that why Stacy de Lacey had captured his parents? Perhaps he was hoping to impress the other rambling isles with human sacrifices. I have to go and find them, he said. The only answer was a snore from Iris. Tired out by all that tail flapping, she had fallen asleep, draped over the dinghy's stern. Oliver did not try to wake her. He could see that she was far too exhausted to help him free his parents. He pulled her into the dinghy and took a blanket from his rucksack over her. He looked around for Mr Culpepper, but the albatross had flown off to talk to some of the gulls, which wheeled in white clouds around the other rambling isles. Oliver scrawled a note to Iris on the inside of a caramel bar wrapper then quickly stripped down to his special explorer's pants. He snapped on some goggles and a pair of frogman slipper flippers, which he found in his rucksack, and dived into the sea. He struck out quickly towards the Thirlstone. Crowds of merpeople and shoals of silver fish darted beneath him, but they were all far too busy and excited to notice him. The Thirlstone's rocky head towered up into the darkening sky ahead of him. On its black sand beach, only the surf moved, but up on its top he could hear sea monkeys cheering and squealing, pounding on stone xylophones and sealskin drums. Oliver swam and swam and swam. He was a good swimmer. He needed to be, after all the shark and crocodile and piranha-infested waters that Mr and Mrs Crisp had made him swim in. But the Thirlstone did not seem to be getting any nearer. He realised that it was moving again, shuffling its way right to the front of that crowd of giants. A little cold finger of panic trickled Olive, tickled Oliver on the back of his neck. He looked back. He had already swum a long way. He was shivering slightly, and although the hallowed shallows might only come up to the knees of rambling isles, Oliver was still far out of his depth. He thought for a moment of shouting for Iris, but he wasn't sure what might happen if the rambling isles or the mer people heard him and realised that a human being had come to their sacred seas. Just then, he noticed that the little cold finger tickling him wasn't panic. It was an actual finger, and it belonged to an actual sea monkey. 
He yelped with fright as the creature doggy paddled round in front of him, grinning madly. Eep, it said, eyes blazing with reflected moonbeams. It grabbed Oliver by his wrist and started pulling him with it through the water towards the thirlstone. For a moment, Oliver struggled, fearful of capture. Then he looked again at the monkey's grinning face and changed his mind. It was trying to help him. Eep, it said again, and with an answering eep, another monkey appeared, sliding over a wave top and seizing Oliver by his other wrist. They chattered at each other, kicking their powerful little legs, hauling him to walk forwards through the water. In ones and twos, they seemed quite cute, he thought. Perhaps they weren't such bad creatures after all. Perhaps they just wanted to play. A third monkey appeared, then a fourth. The thirlstone was definitely drawing nearer now. That rowdy party was still going on above, up above, but from nooks and crevices in the island's shores, more monkeys were jumping down into the surf and swimming out to see what their friends had found. Their small hands stroked and prodded Oliver. They added their strength to his and he surged through the waves closer and closer to Thirlstone's beach. And then, all of a sudden, there were too many monkeys. They all wanted to play with Oliver and the newcomers began to squabble with the ones who'd found him first. Some even climbed onto Oliver's head. Some wrestled his right flipper off and clung gleefully to his toes as he kicked and twisted trying to dislodge them. He started to feel as if he was swimming in wet green fur instead of water. Monkeys were using him as a raft scrambling up onto his shoulders and crowding on his head, forcing him under. A scrabbling, squabbling ball of monkeys surrounded him as he sank, and they were so busy taunting and fighting and teasing each other that none of them stopped to wonder if the boy in their midst could actually breathe underwater. Down and down and down they went while Oliver kicked and punched against the kicking, punching monkeys. He felt his other flipper torn off, then his goggles. Strong little arms tucked him this way and then that way, so that he was afraid they'd pull him to pieces if they didn't drown him first. At last, with a wild jerk, he jacked knife free of them and struck out blindly leaving the monkeys to swirl and tumbling behind him, not realising yet that he'd broken out. The Thirlstone's flank was a dim, dark wall in front of him. A deeper darkness showed in it. Oliver swam in, thinking it was a cleft that might hide him from the monkeys as he clawed his way back to the surface. In fact, it was the opening of a narrow cave. Oliver remembered all those cracks and fissures he had noticed in the Thirlstone side when it first rose from the waves. Hollow, rotten to the core, that's what Clifford said. The passage was too narrow to turn round in, so he swam on, heart pounding, eyes bulging, sure he was about to drown. He clawed through winding stony passages until at last he came up gasping for air at the centre of a flooded cavern. Through a shaft in the ceiling moonlight slanted, shining on the rippled water. Drums and monkey chants came down too, but softly, as if from high above. Things brushed against Oliver's legs as he trod water in the middle of the cave. Weeds or tentacles? He thought of the squids and octopuses that had clung to the Thirlstone's eyebrows. Was this where they lived? Panicking a bit, he swam to the side of the cave and pulled himself out onto a stony ledge. Behind him, the water slopped and gurgled. He imagined disappointing monsters sinking back into the depths. An opening in the rock wall led into another passage. This one was dry 
and moonlight came down it. He crept along it. It sloped steeply upwards, round like a stoned throat. Weeds and ferns grew from the walls and he used them as handholds while he climbed. And that's the end of chapter seven. Hope you're all enjoying the story so far. Make sure you um, watch all of the videos and take care. Missing you lots. Bye.